So we're going to go over math problems and we're going to go over word problems specifically, which is uh, a type of math problem that you will definitely see on your nursing school entrance exam, whether you're taking the ATITs, the HESI, or the Kaplan nursing exam, you'll definitely get these types of questions. So uh, we actually asked everybody in our Facebook groups, you know, what math did they want to go over for these types of tutoring sessions? And most people, the most frequent answer was word problems. So we've got a bunch of those set up. They take a couple minutes to do. It's, it's about five minutes per question. Um, so we're going to try and get through about 10 or 12 of them over the next hour. And Ashley is going to be able to walk through um, kind of how you can answer these problems, how you can answer them faster, kind of tips and tricks for doing these kinds of things. And we do want everybody to participate. So please, if you have a question, if you, um, you know, have anything you want to add to this tutoring session, put it in the comments. So a lot, all the questions that Ashley is going to go over comes from the question bank uh, that is in the Smart Edition Academy TIS online course or the HESI course and Kaplan course. And the question bank is something new that we added to the course. So that gives you a bank of questions that's organized by topics like word problems um, and science and English and reading so that you can study just those types of questions. And that's in the online course. So she's going to be going over the word problems. I think in that question bank, there's about a, there's 103 word problems. So lots and lots of word problems so that you guys can practice things like that. All right. So everybody can hear you guys. So this is Ashley. She is awesome. She's uh, has a graduate degree in math, which always blows my mind how someone can go that far in math. And I know what we've got 53 people on here now, and we all struggle with math. And uh, somehow Ashley has a God given talent where she doesn't struggle with math. And but she's going to help us all get through it. And word problems is kind of a big one for everybody. Ashley, we've had a few requests throughout the day of kind of different types of word problems, um, ones that have like fractions in them. And I think you have a good uh, selection of like 10 or 12 problems to go over today. So I think we'll, we'll probably hit on all those, but um, I will let you know if uh, there's anything, you know, that you're not going over that we might want to see. So uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Sounds good. Um, all right. So you should be able to share your screen. So if you want to do that, you can um, go ahead and get started. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, before I start sharing my screen, um, I just wanted to check in with you all and uh, ask you to have a few things with you if it's accessible. Um, if you can have a notebook, a pencil, and a calculator, because we can use calculators, so that's going to be one of our best friends today. Um, so if you can have those things near, that will come in handy because then we can actually be testing some things out as we go rather than me just talking and going over it the whole time. Um, so just a little background on myself while you all are doing that. I am a, uh, I've been a middle school and elementary school and in high school math teacher. So I've kind of done the whole gamut. Um, and really my goal is to help make this as simple for you as possible, give you some steps you can follow, give you some strategies for uh, those of us who feel a little bit wary of word problems. Cause I know that is something that uh, a lot of people get a little bit, you know, struggle with, can get a little confused on. So we're going to go through all of that. Um, and I see you all dropping some questions in the chat. So John is going to be facilitating that and jumping in to make sure that I am answering all of the questions as we go. Um, so please feel free, put anything in there. So uh, first and foremost, I have a few steps for us just to think about when we're going through some real world mathematical problems. Okay, so these are steps that, um, that I like to use, you'll notice that when I go and read through some of these problems, I'm going to be following these steps. Um, sometimes they're unnecessary. We can kind of jump and skip a step, but especially if you know this is something that you, you know, you're here because you really want to focus on it. This is a great scaffold to use to begin with. So I'm just going to go over this, give you some tips, and then we're going to jump in and do some examples. So first step when we're going through a math problem, a, a, a real world word problem that we have to go through. We're going to read for understanding. So you want to make sure, you know, we're trying to balance time with a real deep understanding of the question. So we make sure that we do this accurately. So I like to, when I'm reading, I'll underline and circle. So you notice that I do that. Um, that's a really great way to have the important information jump out at you when you go and have to try to set up a plan of how am I going to solve these problems? Okay. So read for understanding is the first step. Once we feel like we've got that, Next step is to visualize. Um, I like to draw a lot, and if I'm not drawing a picture, I may be just 
writing out the important information or making a table, putting something off to the side. Um, just so again, so that it's just right there. I don't have to continue to go back to the word problem. I can uh, try to get a deeper understanding through doing that. So step one, step two, step three, then once we have that, we want to try to make a plan. So how are we going to use math to solve this problem that we have in front of us? Um, might be writing an expression or an equation, figuring out what do I need to do to get to my answer, right? So once we do that, then we can go to step number four, we can solve, and then we just wanna check and make sure that our answer is actually answering the question that is asked, because that's something that comes up a lot is we go through the process, we think we're done, but the, the answer that we get doesn't actually answer the question that was asked. So those are just a few steps. Um, you will notice on each example, I actually have this for us to refer back to. Okay, so feel free if this is something that you want to jot down, um, but we will see this again multiple times as we go. Okay, so these are gonna be the five steps that we use. And I'm just gonna toggle over to the next slide and give us a few tips, you know, just a few more things to keep in mind as we go through some of these work problems. Okay, so a few tips that we may utilize. Um, one thing that I really like to do is jump straight to the question so that we, when we read for understanding, we know what to focus in on. We know what is important. We don't get, you know, we don't get sidetracked by superfluous information. We just go straight to what we need. So we can jump straight to the question and then go and read through for understanding and be a little bit more focused. And kind of piggybacking with that, we can also just reread the problem. So again, it's kind of this balance of efficiency since it is timed, but you wanna also have the accuracy. So rereading the problem can be really helpful to make sure that you are ready to then make a plan and tackle it. Okay, another tip is just to ask, does my answer make sense, right? So we get to the end, we think we're answering the question that's asked, then just do a quick self check. Does this make sense? Does this sound reasonable? And if it does, then you know, hopefully then we're on the right track. And then just a couple more things to maybe save us a little time, maybe use estimation at different points, but then using your calculator again is gonna be a really great way to save your mental energy for when you need it and uh, do some things a little bit quicker. So I just put a little note at the bottom that just remember it's a time test. So if any of these strategies can help you save time or energy, like let's use it, let's try to do that. We're gonna get started on our first example. So if you can have your notebook, pencil, calculator, you can kind of do this along with me. Um, or if you'd rather just sit back and take this in and you know watch the strategy in play, feel free to do that as well. So here is our first example of the night. So I'm gonna go through and um, also just bear with me because I will be using my mouse for all of this, which is a little tricky when we're doing this on the computer. Um, but here we go, we're gonna go through, first step, I'm just gonna read for understanding. Okay, so a patient receives 1,200 milliliters of fluid. So I'm gonna underline that. Every four hours, okay, over the course of 24 hours. So I'm kind of pulling out what I feel like is important as I'm going through. How much total fluid does the patient receive in one day? So I'm gonna go through and circle that because that's the question that's being asked. How much total fluid does the patient receive in one day? Okay, so I'm reading for understanding. Now it's my job to try to visualize and make a plan. So for me, I think visualizing for this, I might not draw a picture. If a picture works for you and you like that visual aspect, like feel free, I'm just gonna type out my important information off to the side a little bit. So I see 1,200 milliliters every four hours. Okay. And that's for a course of 24 hours. And then I know I'm gonna have to find out how much in one day. So I've got that there. That's what I can focus on from now on. So when I go to set up a plan, one thing that's standing out to me is that I'm given kind of different units here, whereas the milliliters is good for the fluid, but then we're talking about four hours and then we're talking about one day. So I'm just gonna go through and I'm gonna convert this one day into what I know is 24 hours. And then I can just focus it on the hours, okay? So that's gonna be kind of my first couple steps where now I am going to make this plan and try to solve it. So if I know 1,200 milliliters every four hours, 
the question I'm asking myself is, well, how many different doses or how many times is that going to happen throughout the day? So I'm going to take 24 and I'm going to divide that by the four hours, how often that happens, and I will get six. And again, if division and multiplication facts are not your strong suit, grab your calculator and plug it in. 24 divided by 4 would give us 6. So we know that there's going to be 6 different times that this patient is getting 1,200 milliliters. And so my last step is to take that dose, the milliliters, times the 6 different doses throughout the day. And again, great opportunity to grab your calculator, 1,200 multiply that by six and I get 7,200 milliliters. So now I've solved and I'm just gonna check and make sure I'm answering the question that is asked. So does it sound reasonable that if a patient got 1,200 milliliters every four hours, the course of 24 hours, how much would they get in one day? That's 24 hours, six times. Okay, this sounds reasonable to me and I see it as an option which is even better that I uh, can feel confident with my solution. Okay, so I am really taking my time with this just to show you the process, right? Some of this may feel a little bit, a little bit too in depth for you. So this may feel right on target. So whatever you need to do, um, that's just one example of how we might solve this problem. Yeah, it looks like everybody had that right. Everybody was kind of guessing the answer in the chat. Love just it. about everybody has 7,200 milliliters. So uh, everybody's doing well. Good job, guys. Awesome. Good stuff. Very cool. All right. So I'm going to move on and let's look at another um, question. If you can use a proportion for this question. Hmm. Yeah, I think we definitely could use a proportion for this question. OK. How does yeah. that kind of work differently? Yeah. So if we were going to set up a proportion. Um, and, and, and is that kind of the best way to do it or does it matter if you did it you know the way that you just showed or a proportion is one better than the other or gotcha. a better use of your time kind of cool all right I'm just gonna change my color so we can see this is a different a different way to do it um, and then once I show this we'll see you know we can kind of see if one maybe was quicker or made more sense than the other um, so I'm gonna set this up and I know, I'm kind of like using this first thing of information as a key fact. So again, my apologies, but I'll try to make this as neat as I can. So 1,200, and I like to put units when I do proportions to make sure that I'm keeping consistency. So I'm gonna put that on the top, and I know that's happening every four hours. So that might be how I set up the first part of my proportion. And then proportions, they need to be equal. We're keeping some semblance of equality here. So I don't need to know, right? My question is how many milliliters throughout the full day. So I can put a question mark. I can use a variable. Um, I'm just going to put X, just throw a little algebra in there because that's what I'm used to. But again, you could just leave a box, leave it blank. It doesn't matter. But that's what we're going to try to solve for. And then that's over the course of 24 hours. So I want to make sure that my milliliters are on the top and my hours are on the bottom. So from here, a few different ways that you can actually go through and solve a proportion. Um, I'm very used to doing some cross multiplication. This might bring you all back a little bit where I would go ahead and go ahead and multiply across the equal sign. We could also just solve this like an equation if algebra is your thing. Equivalent fractions, there's a lot of ways to do this. I'm just gonna show you this way for now. Um, and let me just extend this page a little bit. So again, I'm gonna take my calculator because I have to do 1,200 times 24. And let me just type this in, it'll be a little easier. When I do that, I get 28,800 and that will equal, I have to do on the other side four times X because I used X as my placeholder. And then the last step, Basically, what is this is saying is 28,800 is equal to four times something. So I'm just going to divide by four in order to solve and works out just the same that we find our solution to be 7,200 once again. So both are really 
totally valid ways to solve this problem. I don't necessarily think one is quicker than the other. Um, just kind of if you saw proportion right away, then that's a great way to do it. And if not, you can kind of work through it and talk through it in the way that I did in green. So that was an awesome question. Thanks for bringing that up. Perfect. Thank you, Ashley. Cool. No problem. Yeah, someone mentioned that they like that technique better. So Perfect. Hopefully, hopefully that helped. Uh, Cecilia yeah. said that. Awesome. Awesome. All right, so example number two. I'm going to go through the same strategy where I'm going to read for understanding and then kind of start to make a plan and see what I've got to do. So let's see. A patient needs to take five tenths, which is the same as one half, okay, gram per day for one of his medicines. How many milligrams per day does he need for this medicine? Okay, so reading for understanding, the question here is how many milligrams? Okay. So there's not as much to kind of visualize in this kind of a straightforward question, um, but in order to make a plan, the no thing that I'm noticing here is I have to go from what I was given as 0 0.5 grams, and somehow I have to get to a certain number of milligrams. So I have to go from grams to milligrams. So we've got a conversion. And I think I saw some people mentioning this in the chat. So this is, uh, this is one example. I'll show you two different ways to do it. Okay, and then if there's any other thoughts on how we can do it, we will go from there. So I like to use a piece of information that I know in order to get to this like missing amount of milligrams. So what I know is that one gram is equal to 1,000 milligrams. That's a fact that I know. I can use that to help me, okay? So if one gram is equal to 1,000 milligrams, you might see, well, okay, half of a gram would just be half of that, right? So 0 0.5 grams would just be, I could do 1,000 divided by two. That would give me half. That would be 500 milligrams. So that's one kind of straightforward way to do it is when you know this fact here. Um, I'll just go through and I'll highlight that because that was kind of the important piece here. When we know this, then we can use it to figure out, okay, well then that's the same thing as 500 milligrams and this would have to be my solution. Okay, so that's one strategy. I also have kind of a fun strategy for those of you who a um, little bit more of audio learners or you like, um, like phrases or uh, acronyms that you can remember. Um, this is something that I have stuck in my memory since I was in probably elementary school. Um, and it stands for different ways that you can convert in the metric system. So I'm just going to write down the first letter. It's King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk. And I hope that doesn't offend anybody. Chocolate milk is delicious. But let me show you how this works. So all I did, King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk. And what this does is this helps us move the decimal place because the metric system is awesome, runs off of a place value system. So all we really have to do is move the decimal and you'll notice this once I'll, I'll show you real quick. So what did we have to do? We had to go from grams, which is in this case is the B, that's our base unit. There's no like prefix in the front. So we have to go from grams to milligrams. So I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna hop once, twice, three times. And that actually should have been a little M, my fault, I made it all capital. But we have to hop three times. So if I go back, to over here, I had 0 0.5 grams, I have to go to milligrams. I'm just gonna go and I'm going to do the same thing where I hop, ready? One, two, three, and I'm moving my decimal place. And what's actually happening is those little spots that do not have anything here, that's where zeros go. So instead of this being one half, when I move my decimal place, it ends up over here, that is where the 500 comes from. Okay, so just a little like mnemonic phrase, a little trick that can help you because converting within the metric system is super important um, for us to be able to do kind of quickly. So um, those are two different ways that we could go from the half a gram that we know to the milligrams that we needed. Okay. 
So feel free if any questions about that. Um, and I will actually, I'll type this phrase out for you too, if that's something that feels helpful. And we, um, yeah, it looks like everybody did pretty well on that one. People are putting the answers um, awesome in the comments and everybody had 500 milligrams. So uh, we've got a sharp crew out here tonight. Yeah, we do. I love that. Very cool. All um, right. So someone, so, uh, you know, we have, we have a lot of folks on here, almost 100 people, and uh, I'm, I'm particularly bad with names. So sometimes I just say, mm -hmm. should I even try and butcher the name or just read the question? Um, I think it's Nema Abdi. I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, she says, so the base unit is where you would either move from right or left? Exactly. Yes. Okay. So, yep. Because we were going to the right, that's the way we move the decimal. If we were yep. going to the left to kilograms, for example, then we, you know, that's the way we move the def decimal. Okay. Awesome question. Okay. And then Cynthia is asking, how do you know to start with the B? Cool. So the B is just our base unit. So it could be grams, it could be liters, could be, you know, anything that doesn't have a prefix in front of it, that is our base unit. So it's not like decimeters or centimeters or millimeters or kilometers. It's just meters. Then that would be your base. In this case, okay. we have grams. Okay. So yeah, two people had that question. Um, someone's asking, what does each letter stand for? That is King Henry died drinking I chocolate, milk. chocolate milk. Um, right. And that's, yeah, so let's see. It's actually, huh, I wonder how much I remember each of these. I haven't. So it'd be kilo would be the first one. And then hecto, like a hectogram. Um, let's see. I think this one is deca. Yeah, and then, kilo. Guys, jump in the comments. Help us out. Yeah, see how, how much you remember. This is a little yeah. rusty for me. Yeah, so. Yep, and then. Plenty, Millie. Yeah. Awesome. Boom. They got it. got it. Awesome. Thanks for your help. Great. All right. So this one is a little bit longer. I chose this one because that can be a source of issues in and of itself because it's a longer question. So I'm going to read through it and uh, figure out how we might solve this. So it says, if Daniel owes the bank $36,000 for his student loan and pays $750 towards the principal each month, how long will it take Daniel to pay off his debt? So that is my question. Then it says, Daniel does not have to factor interest rates into his payment because he works for a company that pays off student loan interest for up to five years. That's pretty awesome. Okay, so we don't have to worry about interest. What we are dealing with is, again, this might be, there's a lot of information here. I am just gonna pull out what I need off to the side. This is my version of visualizing at the moment. Okay, so $36,000. And he's going to pay seven fifty per month. Okay, so we want to know how long it's going to take him. So thirty six thousand, and if he pays seven fifty per month, in this case, because we're paying the same amount every month, all we have to do is divide. So we just take his total that he's going to have to pay off, divide it by the seven hundred fifty dollars he's paying per month, and this will tell me how many months. He has so again great opportunity to use your calculator and let it do the hard work for you and we find that the answer is 48 months so i get my solution to be 48 months which does sound reasonable to me but then when i go look at all of my answers they are in terms of years right so this is one time where once we go and we go and check ourselves to see if we're answering the question it doesn't always line up so now we have one more step so we have to figure out how to convert from months to years, okay? So all we have to do is take 48 and there are 12 months in a year. So if I take 48 divided by 12, this one happens to work out really nicely and we find that it will be exactly four years for Daniel, Daniel to pay off his student loan. And then I see that is a solution and there we go, there's my answer. Example number four says, if a taxi costs $6 plus $5.65 per mile and a customer needs to travel 18 miles, how much will their cab fare cost? Okay, so there we go. Again, we've got some important information and we're trying to figure out how much the cab fare is going to cost. 
So a few different ways that we could set this up. But what is most important to note is that this $6 here is like the base cost, right? You're paying $6 up front, probably just to even step into the taxi. And then we're gonna pay $5.65 per mile. So if we think about that as that's one cost and then the $5.65 per mile, well, maybe I'll just say that M is gonna be our miles and I'll just add that as a little let statement there. Let M equal the number of miles that we're going. This is essentially what we're gonna need to solve for. And if we know we have to go 18 miles, okay, then we're just gonna multiply that by 18. So one thing that it is important to note when you go to do this, okay, is that we have to do the multiplication first in order to get the right answer. So we cannot add the six plus the 565 first. We have to multiply first. So I'm gonna plug in my calculator, 5.65 times 18, okay? And then that is going to help me simplify that to, what did I get? 101.7, and then I can add the six back onto that, and I will get 107.7. Oops, that should be an equal sign, sorry. Okay. So that's what we get as our answer. And when we go and look, because it's in dollars, we just have to, again, which one makes sense now that we know that's our solution, it would be $107.70. Perfect. And that is what we see. I don't know. There's at least a dozen people in here who have answered that correctly. So that is awesome. Um, awesome. So there, before we go to the next one, there is someone uh, named Kim Farkas in our group who has been wanting to get a question answered for like, I think more than a day or two. And I told her we would try and cover it in the session. Kim, if you're on the call, do you, can you unmute yourself? And I know you said you wanted to ask um, a question. Uh, Oh yeah, I was like I was like in the middle of like trying to type it in, but it was like taking forever. So <laughs> So well I I just put in the chat for Ashley to look at the one you asked about um if a baseball is fifteen feet high. Yeah, that one. Is that the one you wanted to uh, work through? Yeah, that yeah, that was like my main like foe. I mean there's another one, but that one I couldn't <laughs> even begin to figure out how to work that one. Okay. Cool. Okay, I am. I don't just, know if you can pop that in a slide or something. Yep, I'm popping it in real quick so that we can all see it and work through it together. All right, everybody, give it up for Ashley. She's taking requests on the spot, <laughs> doing questions. She's doing really well tonight. Awesome. Okay, and then now we've got one. We're going to be doing it live. We'll do it together. So keep doing what you all are doing. Type it in the chat uh, if you see it, and we'll talk through this one together. All right, let's see. If a baseball is 15 feet high when a stopwatch reads 3.2 seconds and 30 feet high when the stopwatch reads 3.6 seconds, what is its vertical speed? That is rate of change of height. Assume the speed is constant between 3.2 and 3.6 seconds on the stopwatch. Okay, cool. So this actually is one that I, for me, I feel like I would want to draw a quick picture. Um, so I'm just going to sketch a real quick picture of what this is telling me. So we've got a baseball one over right here. Okay. And this is at 15 feet. So I'm just kind of start trying to visualize what this is telling me. So it's 15 feet. And this is when the stopwatch is reading 3.2 seconds. Okay. So then we go all the way up to 30 feet. All right, so now the baseball is all the way up here and it's at 3.6 seconds. Okay, so this feels really helpful to me just to have a picture and, and really see it as a real problem versus just a bunch of words, right? So what is its vertical speed? This is what I need to find, okay? So the rate of change of the height, the vertical speed, it looks like if I'm talking about the height, this is going to be measured in feet, right? We had 15 feet and we had 30 feet. Um, and then the rate of change means, a lot of times we can think of like miles per hour, that's a rate of change. In this case though, we're thinking of feet per, and my unit for time is seconds. So I need to basically find what is the speed in feet per seconds. So 
it looks like what is happening is the baseball went from 15 to 30, which would be a difference of 15 feet. Okay, and how long did that take? So if you can see with the decimal subtraction, you can see it right away, or again, don't be shy, feel free to plug it in your calculator. We find 0 0.4 seconds. So this is okay, um, but we often don't see it with that decimal on the bottom, and I highly doubt if this was a multiple choice, that would be our solution. So the last step is really just to simplify and actually divide. What is 15 divided by 0.4? And this gives me 37.5. So my final solution here would be 37.5 feet per second. That would be the speed. Okay, so feel free to jump in if anything that I said didn't make sense or if you saw a different way to do it but that's what I see hopping out at me at first. So you first you figured out the difference in the heights mm -hmm. and you subtracted the 36.6 .6 from the 33.2 uh, seconds or the 3.6 from the 3.2 and just kind of made a fraction out of it? Exactly, because that's all, um, all that rate of change of height, that verbiage is really just like, okay, what's happening to the height in a certain amount of time. So again, because they gave us feet and seconds, then we have the feet per second. So if it helps to think of miles per hour as kind of like a scaffold, and then you can just change the units. In this case, it's gonna be feet per second. Okay, yeah, because there was like a few like questions like this and like the um, the smart edition, like the, the math tests, and I couldn't even like, it just hurt my brain. <laughs> I didn't even know to start with it. Does this help a little bit, or you feel a little more understanding yeah, how this problem was set up? Like and... I can like, yeah, no, with this one, I kind of feel like I kind of understand how to break it apart now. Awesome. Before, it was just looked like an overwhelming amount of information. Right. That's what I feel like can be such a barrier to entry with a lot of these problems is because it's so much information. So again, like I said, that's why I drew this little picture. It's nothing fancy, it takes me two seconds, right? But this feels so much more helpful for me to say, okay, what do I have to go do to go from 15 to 30? What do I have to do to go from 3.2 to 3.6? And then exactly like you said, Kim, I just put it as a fraction and simplified it, use my calculator to simplify it. All right, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so, yeah, and I actually, the next question that I had on here, I was going to give you all a chance to read it and try it on your own as well. So this might be a great opportunity for you to just apply some of the things we have talked about, L look at some strategies, use your calculator to help make it a little bit quicker. Um, and then I'll just kind of bang through the answer. So feel free to pop it in the chat when you think you know the solution to example five. I'll just zoom in a little more. There you go. Um, this this particular question is definitely one that if you you could probably do this in about 30 seconds if you see what to do off the bat. Okay. Um, some of these questions are a little more in depth, but it's like, you know, um, definitely, definitely once you start to get into to a flow, one or two minutes on each of these questions is really a yeah. great place to be. Okay. So I know a lot of folks in here are sitting for the TEAS test, the nursing school entrance exam. And on that okay. test, you have 36 math questions in 54 minutes. Cool. So, you know, the, the math exactly, it's, it's um, I could do the math, but it's something like you have about 30 seconds um, and you have about an hour to answer 36 questions. So yeah. you need to, everybody needs to be working to be answering these, you know, in under a minute, for sure mm -hmm. you need to be under a minute um, and 30 seconds is even better. And guys, I'll, I'll just step in. I just, we, I, I just wrote a whole blog post and we'll be recording a video later this week about practice tests. And one of the best things about practice tests is it's not as much for learning and, and doing these questions. You, you're applying what you've learned, but what it's really good for and like the time test, you know, say that are in the Smart Edition Academy online courses, the timed test is like is like your enemy. So you guys need to be working within that time frame, and that's really what you want to be using that practice test for to make sure you can answer all the questions in the time given that 54 minutes at least for the TEAS. And you also want to be able to identify certain types of problems that you're having trouble with. Um, and a lot of times it's word problems. 
uh, pulling out the numbers, knowing what are the important numbers, setting up those equations and being able to answer them, it gets really difficult and, and being under a time constraint, you have to really practice and, and, and work and practice and practice and practice to be able to do these in 30 seconds. So yeah, someone saying anxiety is my enemy, that's what these practice tests are for. That's why they're timed so that you can become comfortable with sort of being under the gun per se uh, and being able to answer these questions. Um, so that's just kind of my anecdotes as everybody's working through this. Um, looks like everybody is answering $93.50 is the uh, consensus here for most people. Um, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So just, uh, just for this one to show you real quick, if you saw you had 425 and we're just multiplying that by 22 to get the 93. 50. So this again was like one that was fairly straightforward. And when you see a question like this a few times and you start to, like John was saying, you start to see it and you can do it quickly. Um, and so that way, when some of those questions are longer and you need to take more like a minute or so, uh, it can balance out a little bit better. So um, just because we are running out of time a little bit, I had a few fraction questions and we cannot leave here without doing a fraction or two. So um, I'm going to just bounce over to the next slide and talk through this one a little bit because it has a few things going on. So I'm just going to try to bang out a few of these so that you uh, so that you can have these to look back on. Um, so a teacher buys four bottles of water for class. Each bottle of water contains three liters. Each cup holds two fifths of a liter. So I'm pulling out that important information. And my question is how many cups can be filled? Okay. So I know we've got four bottles and each bottle of water contains three liters. So everything is in liters, which is great. I don't have to worry about converting. But what I do need to do is I need to figure out how many total liters do we have. So I'm going to take the four bottles times the three liters in each one and find that we have 12 total liters. Okay. Now I'm trying to figure out how many cups can I fill with that? How many different cups are we going to fill? So I'm going to take that 12 total and I'm going to have to divide this, okay, the total and we're trying to separate into even groups. That's going to be division. So I'm going to divide this by, well, each cup holds two fifths of a liter. So I have to divide it by two fifths. So 12 divided by two fifths is what I need to do. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick little reminder of how we divide and multiply fractions. Um, this is just something that hopefully will stick and help you, uh, help you figure out how to do these ones. So 12 divided by 2 fifths. Could draw a picture. I could do a lot of different things. But for time's sake, the quickest way to do this is to remember when we divide by fractions, this is another little acronym that can be helpful, KCF. Not KFC, but close. KCF means keep, change, flip. So I'm going to keep the 12. I'm going to change my division sign to multiplication. And I'm going to flip the 2 fifths. And this is called my reciprocal. I'm going to just flip it. And now all I have to do is multiply. Okay, Multiplying fractions is a whole lot easier because I can just plop a 1 under here and multiply across the top and across the bottom. So 12 times five gives me 60, and one times two is just two. So keep, change, flip allows me to go from the fraction, uh, from dividing fractions to multiplying, and then all I have to do is 60 divided by two, which gives me 30. So again, just asking myself, does this make sense? Could I fill 30 cups? with 12 liters, that sounds reasonable to me. And there is my solution. Okay, so quick reminder about dividing fractions, KCF, keep change flip, and then multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom. Okay. Well done, Ashley. Very well done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. She's this good. Guys. She's really good. She's really good. I've got a lot of little tips and tricks that I hope you guys are able to, to hold on to and uh, hopefully it'll make some of this stuff a little less scary and anxiety inducing because I know how it can be. Um, so this next example I thought was super interesting because it's just like a lot when you look at it. 
Um, but there's some really cool tips that can and tricks that can make this pretty easy. So it says in a game, positive and negative points can be scored. Okay, so for 10 turns, we've got 10 turns. This is your point total. We've got a negative five, a positive four, negative seven, negative two, zero. Positive three, positive five, negative six, negative four, positive two. It's a lot going on. Then we find the question, what is the average point total? So I have to make sure I understand what that question means before I can attempt to solve it. So average, important to remember that when we're finding the average of something, we need the sum Okay, and if you remember, sum just means we're going to add them all up. So I'll just put a little plus sign next to this. Okay, so we have to add all of these different point totals up, and then we have to divide it by the number of, in this case, it's the number of turns. Okay, so I just want to find, on average, what points did I score per turn? So I'll just write turn. There we go. Okay, so... Um, I found this one to be pretty cool because there's a really quick way to go up and add these all. If you have a calculator that, I don't know if you can do negatives on the calculators you're able to use, but this actually works out really nicely because if you think about how positives and negatives work, they can cancel each other out. And when I add this up, it'll actually be pretty quick. So I noticed that I had a negative five and a positive five. They actually just cancel each other out. I also see a negative two and a positive two. So when I say cancel out, I mean they just equal zero, okay? So there's some things that I could just add together and they could equal zero. Um, if I just look, I have positive four, negative seven, positive three, negative six, negative four. I'm kind of, it's almost like a little bit of a game here where I'm like, well, plus three and plus four would be plus seven, which will cancel this thing out. And then all I have left is zero, negative six, and negative four. And I'm just gonna add those together and get negative 10. So this is one strategy. Another strategy is just to go through and add the positives and then add the negatives, and then you can put them together. Um, this way is just kind of worked out really nicely that we could do all of these and just get negative 10. And if I divide that by the number of turns, which was 10, a negative divided by a positive is a negative. 10 divided by 10 is one. So on average, the point total per turn was negative one. Okay, so this is a question that you could do a hundred different ways. This is just a quick little trick when you're dealing with positives and negatives. Let's see. I'm just gonna look of the questions. I'm thinking we probably just have time for one more. So I'm going to skip to the last question I have and go back to dealing with a little bit of fraction stuff because we did multiplying, dividing, but this one, we may have to do something a little different. So I'm going to zoom in a little more and let's just try to tackle one more together. So Benjamin buys three and one third, two and one half, and one and three quarters of yards of fabric at a store. How many total yards did he purchase? All right, so my question, how many total yards? I first need to figure out what does that mean? What do I have to do with these three pieces of fabric? So total tends to mean we're gonna add them together. We're gonna find how much we have all together. Um, so I'm gonna figure out how I can add three and one third plus two and a half plus one and three quarters, okay? So I'll give you a quick little reminder of how we add fractions and just show you a little trick of what I might do with all of these. These are all mixed numbers, all of these tricky mixed numbers. So for me, I find it a little bit easier to go through and just add the whole numbers first and kind of get rid of those. So I'm gonna add two, I'm gonna add three, and I'm gonna add one, okay? So I'm just gonna add those all together first and know that I have this to begin with. So three plus two plus one would just give me six. All right, then I have to go through and I have to add my fractions. So um, just for time's sake, I'm gonna write fractions with a little slash mark. It'll be a little easier. So I have to do one third plus one half plus 
3 fourths. Okay, so adding fractions, so, so, so important to remember that we need to have, okay, to add fractions, I'll just put this down here. Oops, let's put this down here real quick. Okay, to add fractions, we need a common denominator, which is really just a fancy math term for the bottom number needs to be the same. Okay, we need to have the like term on the bottom. So what you can do to figure out what your common denominator is, is you can find the multiple that comes up for all of them. So multiple is just kind of like skip counting. Three, six, nine, 12, 15. That would be my list for three. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Okay, I see 12 coming up twice. If we are lucky and it looks like we are, I notice that 12 comes up for each of these numbers, which is important because they all have to be the same. So I'm gonna convert each of these fractions into an equivalent fraction that has 12 as the denominator. So one third, in order to get to 12, I had to go one, two, three, four times. So I have to multiply the top and the bottom by four. One times four would just be four. Okay, so that's my first fraction. Then I'm going to add one half, turning that into an equivalent fraction with 12 on the bottom would be six twelfths. And then last but not least, I had to go one, two, three. I'm gonna multiply the top by three and the bottom by three. And then I just need to add all these lovely numbers together. When I am adding fractions with a common denominator, I'm just gonna add the top number and keep the bottom. So four plus six would be 10 plus nine would be 19. So really what I have here is I have this six and then I have this 19 over 12, which six and 19 twelfths is not a solution. Okay, but this is a top heavy fraction, which I think we can change. So 19 twelfths is the same thing as one, and then there'd be seven twelfths left over. So one and seven twelfths is now what I can add with my six, and one plus six is seven. So I know, and this is another one where maybe estimation would have been really helpful if fractions are just not your jam, but I did wanna show you and give you a reminder of how to do this. If I could have estimated a little bit, I might've been able to figure this out, but notice that all of these multiple choice answers are kind of close to each other. So um, we might have to actually go through all of the steps here. Um, so that's just a quick little reminder too of how do we add fractions when they don't have a common denominator? Um, another one from Kim, she was asking, uh, what's a shortcut for finding common denominators when you don't have a picture of a times table burned into your brain uh, and you don't have a lot of time to try to figure it out? Any shortcuts there? Um, I, you know, we do have our calculator at our disposal. So say like, you know, when I was doing this here, even if this wasn't like something that I had memorized, I could create this by just saying, okay, I know I have to start with three. So I'm gonna do three times one is three. Three times two is six. Three times three is nine. I might know that or I might just be plugging that in my calculator. It'll only take you one extra second to plug it in your calculator. Um, but that could be a trick to kind of get past that as an obstacle is just when you're finding the least common denominator, you're just finding multiples. So you just kind of go through and multiply the number you start with times one and then times two and then times three and then times four, or even just do three plus three is six plus three is nine plus three is 12 plus three is 15. Two plus two is four plus two is six plus two is eight. Those are two different ways that you can then just use your calculator to help you get the same kind of list. So guys, I mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, if you don't have the online course and you want access to these questions that are in our question bank, uh, there's, you know, for the TEAS, there's eight practice tests. I think that Kaplan has four practice tests. Um, the HESI is four or five. Um, it, lesson modules, video lessons, all that stuff. All that stuff's in our course. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Best of luck to everybody. I'm going to hang on for another five minutes, and I'm just going to walk through uh, one of the online courses. So if anybody wants to take a look at what is available to them with that course, 
hang on for the next like three or four minutes. I'll do a quick little run through of it. Michelle, okay. you're asking when the next class is. We're usually doing these once a week and we mix it up between math, science. Um, we did chemistry the other week, a lot of anatomy and physiology. Um, so those are usually weekly. We do notifications in our Facebook group and uh, you'll also get it to your email. If you're signed up for like SMS text messages, you'll get it there. So this is the full online course. And when you are in this course, I'm just gonna make my screen big. Um, you're gonna have a bunch of different things in here. You're gonna have lesson modules for all the sections of the test. So reading, math, um, science, and English. And if I go into any of these lesson modules, maybe I'm gonna look at the cardiovascular system. Uh, and there's going to be a lesson module on every single topic in every single subject, so it's all totally covered for you. So once we get into the lesson module, uh, what you'll see is that there are video lessons for every lesson module. There's about 50 lesson modules, and a lot of these lesson modules have like more than one video in them. So just for this, um, just for this cardiovascular lesson, there's two videos. Um, Melissa looks like she does these videos. Um, and if you click on these videos, I know they're Welcome about to Smart 10 Edition's video minutes, tutorial maybe this one's on 11 the cardiovascular minutes. system part. Um, so you're going to have video lessons for every single lesson. And these are kind of a good primer to, you know, um, get you ready for the material that you're about to read. And it's really good because it does give you material however you like it. So if you like videos um, or you like to listen to things, you can watch the videos. If you prefer to learn uh, by reading, you can read these lesson modules like this. I did go for those. Um, and then as you're going through these, um, we do have a study guide book as well, but what you'll find in the course is that it's a lot more interactive than you would get with a study guide book. So you're going to have kind of questions throughout that you can answer. Um, and then it's not just going to be like multiple choice questions. Um, you're also going to have things where you like mix and match type questions. So I think um, in this case, you have to place each event in the order that they occur. Um, so you'd have to drag this around and um, answer this correctly for the uh, order of events. Um, and so that would that's kind of a different type of question. It's not all just multiple choice. Um, so that's kind of what these lessons are going to be like. Um, another one where we kind of label diagrams. And uh, I think there's an EKG chart in here. Um, where you kind of get the idea, I'm going to have to like drag things here and put things in the right spots, and then I can check that answer. Um, so you guys kind of get the idea of what a lesson module is composed of. Um, and same thing, here's an EKG chart, and you would have to uh, label that you know correctly with you know to the corresponding numbers, uh, which part. So. You get the idea, and at the end of each lesson, there's a review, so you get the main points. Um, you know, this one's going to have another thing where we label this diagram and kind of drag these things into the right positions. And then at the end of each lesson, you will also have a set of flashcards. So these flashcards are specifically cardiovascular flashcards. So you can kind of work through these, and you can mark it if you got it wrong or um, if you got them right, and it will kind of start to filter out and show you just the ones that you got wrong. Um, if you're going through and doing those. Um, so that is a lesson module. And then the other big component to the online course is the practice tests. So you have access to, I'm going through the TEAST course, uh, the Kaplan course, and the HESI course. It's all organized the same way, uh, very similar. Um, just the exact topics that will be in that course are going to be different depending on the test. Um, for the TEAS online course, there is eight practice tests. Um, you've got four here. If I go to the next page, I would get the other four. And I'll go in here, and I can click on any of these. Um, let's say I'll do the science again. And these are going to be timed practice tests. They're very similar to what the actual test will be like. Uh, these practice tests have gone through many iterations over probably the past four or five years to be very, very similar. Um, you know, in terms of being timed, but also the types of questions that we're asking and how they're asked are very similar to what you'll see on the TEAS. Um, so I'm just going to go to the last question here. It happens to be a chemistry question. Uh, and when you finish this practice test, you're going to get a scored report. And the scored report is really helpful because what it does is breaks down all the questions that were in that 53 question practice test by the individual topics. So 
I think in this test, there's something like three or four cardiovascular questions. And there's a couple of these questions, you know, throughout those 53 questions. But what you'll see is your score for that individual topic. How well did you do? And you should start to get an idea that I answered a lot of the cardiovascular questions incorrectly. Um, the endocrine system, I answered them all correctly. Uh, chemical bonds, I didn't do well on. So you can get an idea of what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. And this is where this is really valuable. Um, so then you can really focus on your weak areas. And that's one of the best strategies you can do, best use of your time. Use something that can help you identify what your strengths and weaknesses are, and then just go in and go into those lesson modules, watch the videos, do practice questions, um, and get better at those weak areas. That's how you can bring your guys' scores up the fastest. Um, so once I click view questions, I'm going to get all the answer explanations. And these are really in-depth answer explanations. Um, we actually redid these probably a couple months ago to uh, make them much more in-depth, and they kind of explain why the right answer is wrong or the um, or the, why the right answer is correct and the uh, incorrect answers are incorrect. And we put in diagrams and things like that so that you can kind of really learn from these uh, answer explanations as well. So you kind of get an idea what that is like. Um, and they go pretty in depth. They've got the diagrams in them. So those are the practice tests. Uh, you'd have eight of those in the TEAS course. Um, and then I'm going to go to the last page of the course. And the last thing I'll show you is uh, something that we also added uh, a couple months ago, which is the question bank. So you have those eight practice tests, but you also have this question bank. Now, today, Ashley went over a bunch of questions from the math question bank, and she went over to the solving real world mathematical problems. That's your word problems. And most of these have like 20 or 30 practice questions. This one has 103 practice questions, so you have more than enough uh, real world, uh, you know, word problems to practice from. Um, so you can kind of go through here until you can't do them anymore, and uh, it'll go a pretty long way. So you have access to this question bank uh, as well. And so this is kind of if you did that practice test and you saw you did not do well on word problems, go over to the practice bank and practice just those problems so that you start getting better at them, you get quicker at them. Um, and that's kind of the idea of, of using that question bank. Just tons and tons of practice questions um, kind of throughout the course. Uh, and then the last part is just those flashcards. So we do put the individual flashcards in each lesson module. So the cardio flashcards are in that lesson, um, so on and so forth. But we also have uh, another spot for them where we're going to put all the A&P flashcards um, kind of in one big set. So you have 259 just a and flashcards. Uh, you'd have the life and physical science and chemistry flashcards as well. Um, so we kind of break them out so they're in the lesson, but then they're also at the end of the course. So just depending on how you want to work thing, through things, um, you can do that. So that's the whole online course. Um, hey, John, quick question. Um, are they course. changing the T's version test? And if they are, how would it affect uh, when we buy this? How would it affect if it changes? Like, would the context yep. be affected? Or would the what, what would be affected? Yeah, so there's a bunch of questions here. I'm going to get to all you guys. Uh, but for your question, the ATI T6 is changing. They Earlier this year, in the spring, they announced that it would change in October, which is about a month away. Um, uh, sometime in July, they changed it. So it is not October. It is now June 2022. So unless you're taking your test after June 2022, which most of us probably are not, you don't need to worry about it. Um, in terms of this course and how this changes, uh, what's changing with the TIS 7 is uh, all the topics are the same. Every single topic that's in this course is also on the TIS 7. What they changed was the... Uh, the number of the questions in the test and the ratio of like the topics in the test. And so, for example, with science, uh, it was something, you know, like 75% anatomy and physiology. There was a little bit of biology and chemistry. And so now they've changed that where it used to be like two, three chemistry questions. Now you're going to get eight chemistry questions and eight biology questions and fewer AMP. So you get the idea. They're just kind of changing up the ratio. So basically these, uh, you know, nursing schools and allied health schools wanted students to have demonstrate more experience with chemistry and biology, um, not just A and P. So that's how it's changed. And so what we're going to do is 
uh, well, closer to June, probably sometime in the spring, we're going to put out a whole new set of practice tests that will be ATIT seven practice tests. They'll be in this course uh, for some period. There will be both uh, T6 practice tests and T7. After they make that transition, we'll take the T6 uh, practice tests out. Um, so that's kind of the long answer to uh, how that will change and, and what Smart Edition Academy is going to do with this course. Um, for that change. So you don't need to buy any other new courses or anything like that when um, when that gets to the time. Uh, um, ideally, we're trying to do this weekly. Um, Brandon Craft is, uh, uh, with math is amazing, 100%. Lori uh, Broussard, he's awesome. He's a partner of ours. Guys, in this course, all the math videos are actually done by Brandon Craft. We partnered with him. He recorded 50 math lessons for every single math topic, uh, Brandon did a video for us. So if you're familiar with him, check him out. Uh, he's in the course, but you can also check him out on YouTube. He has a website, he's really fantastic. And that's it, so everybody go ahead and have a good night and we will see you guys on the next session. Keep your eyes out for that. We'll post it in the Facebook group and to your email when we announce that next session. It should be probably sometime next week. So we'll post that in the next few days.